In our next section, we're going to talk about unicast high availability that specifically relates within the scope of the VXLAN and BGP eVPN routing. And the underlying components that we saw where we had uh, on IGP like OSPF, ISIS, EHRP, we had PIM for multi-guest routing, we had BGP for the, uh, the actual L2VPN eVPN exchange that's ultimately building the, the entire underlay transport in order to allow us to uh, send the VXLAN traffic across the, uh, the spines. Now, the convergence of this type of network design, so like if a link goes down or a node goes down, it's going to be a function of three different factors. First is going to be IGB convergence, like OSPF or ISIS. Second is going to be PIM convergence for multicast, which would affect our unknown traffic, the broadcast unknowns and multicasts. And then BGB convergence, which is going to be the actual eVPN route. Okay, we'll see that these factors need to be addressed separately in order, in order to achieve full high availability for the overall system, where the way that we tune the BGB convergence is going to be different than IGB convergence, and then likewise for uh, multicast. Okay, so for the first of these with IGP, there's four different factors that we need to think about that are overall going to affect the IGB convergence time. Okay, first and foremost, it's how long does it take us to figure out that there was a failure? So failure detection time could be like the OSPF dead interval, or it could be the, uh, the BGB keep alive timer. So some sort of periodic polling that we're checking to see whether the remote neighbor is up or down. Now, assuming we figure out that the neighbor is down, next step is that we need to react to that failure. We need to tell everybody else in the network, hey, this link went down or this node went down. Okay, so this is going to be our event propagation time. How long does it take from when we figured out that the failure occurred until we were able to tell everybody else that, hey, this failure has occurred? Once everybody knows about it, then we're going to recalculate the topology. So we had the previous set of the topology. We now know about the new changes. Take those new changes, put them into whatever our algorithm is. SPF for OSPF, dual for EHRP, uh, BGB best path selection, et cetera. We need to find what is the next best path. Once we figure that out, then final fourth step is to, is to install this down into the hardware. In the case of Nexus, we're always talking about hardware forwarding with the exception of the Nexus 1000V. So for the 3Ks, 5K, 6K, 7K, 9K, we're talking about doing the layer three uh, routing forwarding in uh, hardware. So this basically means it's, it's the time to take the routing table to move it into the hardware forwarding table to essentially write it down to the TCAM of the uh, physical line cards. Now, the failure detection time, in terms of the methods for this, this would be like, does the link physically go down? Okay, we'll see that assuming that we are using direct point-to-point -point links, most of the times we can rely on the underlying physical optic failure, okay, like the SFP, to know whether the, uh, the link is up or down. So if you have a fiber cut, normally the link is going to know that within five milliseconds and then immediately start to reconverge the, uh, the upper layer protocols. Now, depending on what that layer one design looks like, though, there could be situations where the layer one link status is not a good indication of the end-to-end -end reachability across the circuit. And we'll talk about uh, uh, very shortly here what are some of the solutions for that, like running bi bidirectional forwarding detection in order to make sure that the link status actually uh, does tell us whether the end-to-end -end circuit is uh, available. Okay, but this is also where we would have our regular routing protocol hello and dead timers, like the OSPF hello, OSPF dead timer. Uh, we could also add some application information checking here. Like in the case of the virtual port channel, this is where we saw that we were doing uh, enhanced object tracking to say if these particular links are down, then I want to take some sort of action in VPC or take some sort of action in HSRP. Okay, same, should be, uh, same can be true for IP convergence. Like we could have a static route that's tracking a, a service level agreement. SLA is saying ping this particular IP address. If it's not available, then we're going to remove uh, the static route. Okay, but in our case for data center, 99% of the time we're going to be, re we're going to be re re relying, excuse me, we're going to be relying on uh, the link up down event. In cases where we cannot do that, then we're going to be relying on bi directional forwarding detection. So once we figured out that the neighbor was gone, how do we tell everybody else? Okay, this is going to depend on the individual protocol. So in the case of EHRP, this is going to be the query delay time. 
So how long does it take me to ask the other neighbor, do you have an alternate route to the destination and wait for the replies to come back? In the case of OSPF and ISIS, this is going to be the link state advertisement or the link state packet flooding procedure. In the case of BGB, this is going to be the update messages and then the withdraw messages. Okay, once we figured out that the changes are there, then we need to recalculate. Okay, this is going to depend, again, likewise, based on the protocol. So EIRP dual, OSPF, ISIS's shortest path first, and then BGB best path selection. Okay, those would be tuned separately depending on the individual protocols. Okay, then last but not least, we have the, uh, the forwarding table update time. So it's how long does it take to, ex to actually install the changes. 99% of the time, this is going to be a hardware function that you cannot change. But there are some other optimizations, some proactive things that we can do in order to decrease this time that it takes to uh, flip from one path over to another, which would be things like OSP of loop tree alternates, EHRP feasible successors, BGP prefix independent convergence. So basically to have backup paths pre-installed at the line card, then once we realize that the primary path is down, we just flush that out, and then we go to use the, uh, the backup path that is already installed. Now, we'll, we'll see in the case of the VXLAN fabric, or basically the CLOS fabric, since we're already doing equal cost multipathing between the leaves and the spines, the leaves are going to have multiple routes installed to begin with. So they're already pre-written down into hardware into the TCAM. The main thing that we need to optimize is going to be how long does it take us to figure out that the neighbor was down uh, to begin with. Okay, once the neighbor's down, we can just kick out that old route, continue to forward using the one that was already in there, recalculate behind the scenes, and then if we need to install new changes, we can go ahead and uh, do that. Okay, so an example of this in the case of OSPF, which is what we're running on the fabric, would be first off, we need to figure out that the neighbor's down. Okay, so the dead timer expires. Next thing OSPF does is to do the LSA flooding. So to tell everyone else in the area, hey, there's a change in the graph. Once everybody knows about that change, then we need to rerun shortest path first. Okay, finally, we're going to take the OSPF database, put it into the routing table, put the routing table into the forwarding table, and write that down into the hardware TCAM. Okay, so how can we affect this then, assuming that we want to get lower convergence time? So we're going to have some reactive configurations and some proactive configurations. Okay, the proactive configurations are, are mainly going to be based on software configs. Okay, like in the case of OSPF, by making the area size smaller, by using stub areas, by using default routing where you can, that's going to cut down on the amount of time that it takes to tell the other neighbors that there were changes, simply be, uh, based on the fact that you have less changes to advertise. And then it would likewise speed up the calculation time, because if I have 10 routes to recalculate as opposed to 100,000, then the CPU is going to take less time in order to calculate 10 versus 100,000 or, or whatever the numbers are. Okay, some of these factors are going to be outside of our control, though. Like, how, does it, how long does it take to actually write the changes to the line card? Okay, this is going to depend on the generation of the card, the specific ASICs that are being used. Uh, but there are some ways that we can uh, kind of engineer around this. So proactively, one of the things that we can do is to or actually, uh, excuse me, uh, reactively, this would be, is to uh, say when there is a failure, how do I react to it? Okay, in the case of layer one link status, there's two timers that are called the carrier delay and the link debounce timer. This says when the link physically goes down and you lose the signal from the, from the SAP, from the optic, whatever, how long do you wait before you start to tell the upper layer processes, like the layer two process and above? Now, in normal cases, you would want to set this timer to zero, which means you immediately tell the upper layer protocols. But if you have some sort of problem where the link is bouncing, so maybe it goes down for 10 milliseconds and then it comes back up, you wouldn't necessarily want to start an OSPF reconvergence event and then realize, well, hey, 10 milliseconds later, I was able to keep, keep forwarding traffic. This is the case where you basically want to suppress those errors and it's going to save you uh, convergence time in the long run. Okay, but I think by default, the, uh, the link debounce timer in Nexus is zero. We can see this if we go to the CLI and let's look at the show run interface E11 all. 
which is no link debounce. Okay, on some platforms this is carrier delay, but they basically mean the same thing. So if we look under, and it actually doesn't show it in context sensitive help. Link, this is the command, link debounce is, let's say five. No, at the interface level. Uh, link, debounce, well, it really doesn't give us that much help. Okay, timer in milliseconds. So this would be like to say if the link flaps, but it, it, so it goes down, but if it comes back up within 10 milliseconds, hide that change from the upper layer protocols. Because you might be triggering false positives, basically causing OSPF to reconverge, where there was a, a tiny, tiny blip that doesn't really affect connectivity. And you actually make the problem worse by causing the protocols to react to that as opposed to just leaving the problem alone. Okay, this would be like if you have some sort of long haul link, like for your data center interconnect, let's say, and you want to make sure that just minor changes on it are not going to cause you to, uh, to reconverge. Okay, but we can see by default this one is off on, on this particular platform. So if there is a link flap, it's going to immediately tell the uh, upper layer protocols. Okay, next one would be to optimize the hello timers in the IGPs, okay, or whatever the control plane protocol is. Could be o, it could be OSPF, multicast, could be uh, PM multicast, could be BGP. But we'll see in our particular case, typically you would not want to change the software timers of the actual control plane protocol, like OSPF, because BFD is going to be hardware accelerated on these particular platforms. Okay, we don't really need to know all the deta details of this, just that it, it is hardware accelerated. But if we look at the, the Nexus 7K module comparison matrix, that tells you what particular line cards do or do not run BFD. And then if you look at the individual data sheets for it, it shows you what numbers it scales up to with how many particular BFD neighbors and at what timers. Uh, and uh, where you can also find a lot of this information is, is the Cisco Live presentations on like the Nexus 5K architecture, the 7K and the, and the 9K architecture, which shows the, the specific details of the different generation of the, uh, the ASICs. But point being is that since our platforms are the hardware-based ones, you generally would want to run BFD at the line card as opposed to doing fast hellos, which is going to be based on the general purpose uh, CPU of the supervisor. Okay, some of the proactive optimizations would be putting backup paths in the topology. Okay, so EIGRP feasible successors, this basically means that you, you set your, your metrics, like your delay or your bandwidth, so that you have a primary path and you have a backup path. In our particular case, this is probably not as applicable because in fabric routing, you're trying to do equal cost multipathing. So you want both paths installed as primary at the same time. But if we're talking about convergence, maybe like at the WAN edge, you might have some primary path that you want and then a secondary backup path. You would want to make sure to engineer that, that it's pre-installed in hardware, that if the primary path goes down, you immediately switch over to the, uh, to the secondary one. Okay, so we're not going to get into a ton of details of this because this is going to be going a little bit too deep into the, into the routing protocols for now. What we're mainly going to focus on here is bi-directional forwarding detection.